I want to welcome uh, everybody to the podcast today. You and I talk a lot about theory, John Boyd Zuda Loop, how you can apply it to sports. Rarely do we get somebody who has deep expertise in actually applying John Boyd Zuda Loop uh, to sports. And sometimes they do it without even knowing it, and that's absolutely fine. So our guest today has won multiple national championships, both, both as a player and as a coach. Um, she is retired now, I understand, and we met through a flow research collective, high flow coaching activity that we did uh, about three months ago, two months ago, where we connected on several topics and, and the top one being flow. So welcome to the show, Sue Winquist. Thanks for being here today. And I thank you for taking time out of your busy surfing schedule to be here. <laughs> Thanks so much. It's nice to be here as well and, and meet everybody. So I got to ask, we'll start with surfing right away. What, why do you surf? Just out of curiosity. I grew up surfing. I lived by the beach. And so it was who we were. Uh, it wasn't anything that actually became an activity. It was just part of me and continued to be part of me. And mm -hmm. then as I got older, I was able to use that uh, to my advantage, I feel, uh, when it came to organized competitive sports. Yeah. So in the uh, flow coaching that we went through, we talked about high flow activities. Is there a high flow activity that you can find inside of surfing? Oh, there's no doubt. Oh, those that are just learning how to surf certainly don't experience that usually right out of the gate. But once you become manageable in the water, you know what you're doing. It has incredible effects. One, mm -hmm. in the escape from the digital tentacles. Number two, the integration of a diversity of population that you would never, ever have an opportunity to engage mm -hmm. with. And then the physical performance aspect of the readiness, the unknown, you don't have control mm -hmm. over it. And then once you do get on it, you don't have control over it. So this adjust, adapt, uh, yeah. this mental sharpness that you have to have, and then the constant failure recovery that you experience, it gives you everything just riding these waves that don't cost a dime, you know? So another question for you is, how do you get your players to get focused on the work at hand, whether it be practice or the game? Uh, is there any type of high flow activity that you can take them through pregame or preseason that gets them focused on the work? Well, when I look back now, when we see how important flow is becoming and in traditional sports, mental training, uh, flow activities, they're still considered an, uh, an accessory or an add-on. It has not become a standard in sport. You see more of it in high performance, but I was fortunate to be around some incredible diamond sports, mental performance uh, individuals, Ken Revisa. So he introduced us to uh, the ability to listen to your conscious mind, to organize your thoughts, to stop, be present in the moment, to understand breathing. But this was back in the early 2000s. Right. So now what we need to do is we need to introduce at a very young age uh, for our student athletes this idea that mental performance shouldn't be an add on. It actually should be more like hygiene. Uh, when we get mental performance to become hygiene, we're really going to start to see this. It's really we're in the renaissance of yep. flow and, and mental performance. Yeah, we're right in the middle of NHL uh, postseason as NBA postseason. We just saw the. Uh, March Madness, uh, both men's and women's. We saw the uptick in, in the viewership on the women's side of the of, of uh, the sport. Uh, can we dive in a little bit about that? What's actually separating these teams right now at at this level of performance, both in college and and in professional sports? Well, both are, are very similar. When you're coaching in college, your first thing for the individuals that have that strong foundation around who they are and how they do things. So I always attribute a lot of it has to do with their upbringing, whoever those influencers were. So for us, we really look at the integrity and their what we want to call their awareness about their great greatness. Then they come into college, the programs that have a solid understanding around leadership, both individual and group, because there's a contradiction there, right? Mm -hmm. So individual, we want them to think they're the deal, but then we contradict it and say, be humbled, give up yourself in the team dynamic. Pro is the same way. Pro is just another level of those highly competitive, highly talented, and the teams that win over, I'm really interested in teams that win over time. Mm -hmm. um, thousands of champions, thousands of champions, but there are very few sustainable champions, people that repeat or in the thick of it uh, year after year. Those are the, the teams that you wanna take a look at their patterns and uh, the frameworks that they have. Now what they're doing is they're trying to surround the athlete with the assets that create wholeness, but I still, would love to pull flow, flow science. I would love to pull that out of the asset management 
and put it in the X's and O's. I want flow science to be in with technical and tactical. Yeah, absolutely. Technical, tactical sit alone in sport. Coaches know how to hold time for it. They talk mm-hmm. about it over beers about it. It's technical, tactical, technical, tactical. I want to get our flow science over in technical, tactical. Okay. Uh, when you reflect back on your championships, uh, both as a player and as a coach, uh, and you have the advantage of retrospective coherence, look back on it and say, how did I do this? Uh, what, what strikes you now as what is essential to win over time? What, what are those things that you can share with other coaches and, and even business leaders, what it takes to win over time with differing team members? Well, first of all, I, I'm very careful to talk about what I used to do because Mm -hmm. for a large part of it, I believe I could have been better at it. I didn't do it as well as I could have. I should have put the person first and I put the performance first, but I was also part of the program. Uh, We we wore the men's track team practice t-shirts as game uniforms. And then in three short years, built a championship program. We never looked back and over five decades, six decades uh, we've won. But winning also creates blinders. And so for me, the timeless principles that I would stand by today and back in 19, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, new millennial that I stand by is an uber fanaticism around awareness and improvement and both eyes on the performance gap. In other words, how I'm getting the results and how I'm building a relationship with those results. That's a big void in today youth sport is we're not building a relationship around results. So it's so much now about, we know we have to have that experience. We know we need them to be seen and heard. We're losing track of this fanaticism around results. We want them to love measuring that gap between where I am and where I need to be right now. That's is a fragility there. There's a fragility there that if we appear that we are too fixated on results, we're, we're not taking care of the whole person. In short, great leaders over time, male, female, doesn't matter the gender, don't get caught up on the diversity issues, all those. Here are things that we know are timeless. People that are leading other people around a uber clarity about where we are, how we need to get there, and the relationship with the results along the way in a safe, an emotionally collaborative way, that to me is something you can put your money on. So, so Sue, we uh, believe, Ponch and I believe, uh, and I would, I'm betting that you do, that the, I, the order of people, ideas, and things can never be violated, that the, the person and the human always has to come first, whether it's coaching, whether it's business, whether it's surfing, whether we have to focus on people, ideas, and things. It seems to me that in, the, in, in sports today, we're so wrapped up in analytics and technology, we forget the human-centered uh, nature of, of sport and the human-centered nature of coaching. So that, am I hearing you correctly that, that effective coaching, um, in, in your case, athletics, has always been by focusing on the person first and allowing the ideas and things to complement the, their efforts? I, I do, but where I wished we had even more, where we would be putting in more time is... Right now, we're spending a lot of time around what utopia looks like, right? What you just talked about is the standard that we're all shooting for. I want to be the person that says, uh, memo to 90% of you, that's not going to happen. So raise your children to be aware, this is not a people-centered coach that I have. He's a volunteer that works Monday through Friday and coaches baseball on Saturday morning. He's not people first. I get it. He's results oriented. I know my checkpoints now that I'm with a results oriented leader. No one is covering that dialogue. And these children are coming in getting decimated emotionally because they're, they're, they want to come in as their true self because they've heard that over and over. Amen. I agree with you. That's the perfect world. We've got to get them where they are right now and build a competitive callus. So when they get in there for 90 minutes on a Saturday, they can have fun regardless of the results-oriented coach. Yeah. So we're immersed in AAU basketball at the moment here in our house. And uh, I was going through some of your, uh, your your previous talks on, was it Sharpie? What, what do you call it? Uh, Sharpie? Burden Stain the Sharpie. brain. Stain the brain. Yeah. Yeah. That and the failure recovery. So what we've seen with the coaches at the, you know, the teenage level is the things they say and do are creating an impression on the girls forever, right? It, it, it's going to be in their mind forever. How detrimental is that to 
sports today? I mean, are, are people giving up on sports, kids giving up on sports because of bad coaching? Absolutely. And we have stats, especially with women. My world, those people that don't, my background, my expertise is around women, basically high performing mm -hmm. women and youth, eight mm -hmm. to 28 years old. Um, I watched parenting come across my doorstep for 27 years at UCLA. This is what I know about great parenting. That child, that young girl that comes in, that female that comes in with high self-efficacy, I can look directly to her relationship with her father. Moms, they're off the hook. They've already created that bond. They have that. But I also have words for mom. Hey, mom, she doesn't need another friend. You don't need to be talking to her seven times a day. She needs to solve her own problems, come home and talk about the process that she's working on each and every day. Back to the dad. When the girl is playing sport up to our study show, up to 11 or 12 years old, it's just play, P-L-A-Y. Mm -hmm. Once she gets into organized sport where she's traveling in a car or playing to compete, the dad gets interested, it turns into a sport. Mm. The dad now becomes the dialogue around who I am and how I do it. Dads that have an arm's length, when they come into my office at UCLA and that child, that young adult, is talking to me directly. I can ask the hard, I can bang her right in the forehead with a hard question and she does not become deer in headlights and she doesn't do a 45 degree turn to check to the answer book called the parents. Those dads taught at a young age, process, 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 and they celebrate the process execution and not the goals. They're not about, here are all the mechanics, here are your analytics. It's all about teaching grit, teaching resilience, teaching this ability to fail and recover quickly and then recognize it after it becomes, I call it the drip, drip, drip method of fathering. Mm -hmm. Drip it in there. And when you get in the car after the game, she doesn't want to talk about it. Put your hands at 10 and two, shut your pie hole and let that girl be a girl on her way home. But what do dads do? Our poor dads, they're just shoving that crap down her throat. By the time she gets to the house, she's already entertaining the fact by the time I'm 13, I'm going to quit this shit show. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're talking to me now. This is great. This is great coaching for, for parents in my position, dads in my position. Uh, and, and I think you and I talked about this in the past where when you look at the cognitive development of a, of a teenager um, and you try to apply adult learning techniques to them, it's probably not a good idea, right? So right. here I am taking what I know about effective debriefing and having my daughters reflect back on what happened. And, and based on what you just told me, that's probably not a good thing at, at this age. You know, they just want to kind of leave it alone uh, at, at best knowledge is the way I understand it. Uh, so I might be applying the wrong process there. However, I do think that uh, I, I want to highlight something else you brought up here, and that is the process. And I got I have to ask you about this. Putting the work in in sports, is there any difference from doing that and doing it in academics? Or are they the same, putting the work in? They are absolutely the same in terms mm -hmm. of execution, but in terms of socially how you're explaining it as a parent mm -hmm. is yeah. completely different. Because when I'm in fourth, fifth, sixth grade, no, I've never heard a kid say, hey, Sign me up for soccer because I want to work on it. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't happen. But as parents, we get in there and next thing you know, we surround that kid with this, what I call this orbit of accessories. Now the kid has turned off the freedom brain, the curiosity brain. Now they're realizing I need to do this work because I got to make my parents happy because I hear them talking in the car about scholarship. All of this is staying in their brain. And you're going to say, well, how the hell do you know that, Sue? Because I'm interviewing them in high yeah. school anonymously. Yeah. We've got 45,000 data points of what the daughter is thinking when mom and dad are chatting. And it will curl your nose hairs. This is great, Mark. Yeah, so uh, I'm the dad of a woman Division One athlete. Um, is a rising junior swimmer and from watching her swim from age four to now almost 21, I would, it, it seemed to me what you're describing is a lot of what I observed is like, you stay back, let the coaches coach and let the kid fall in and let her, let her uh, do the work and be there to support when, when they need it. And I would say that I've always seen that the best coaches were the ones that really focused on the person. They really focused on the, on the human aspect of it that we're able to get the performance out on the, on the contrary, the ones who burnt out, the ones who quit when they went to college and, and they burned out 
were the ones that were driven so hard uh, externally and synthetically from what you called, what did you say? You said like sort of the peripheral or sort of the ancillary things that surround that got in the way of the wavelength maybe between the uh, athlete and the team and the coach. Is that, is that, is that a good restatement? Uh, absolutely. That orbit of accessories that yeah, really drowns them out. That's what it was. Yeah. Okay. And you get caught up in it because you get the sense that I'm getting left behind when parent, I believe parenting is an individual game. Mm. Don't get caught up in the mm. team of parenting. Look at the Jones. They just bought the $700 bat. The kid doesn't even have a strong base. Mm -hmm. She could have a $1,200 bat and it's not going to help her. So for me, what's so hard is there is no truth teller for sport parents around the long-term effect. They don't know how to discern truth from fallacy when it comes to raising sport children. Hmm. Which, which is an always evolving, it's always an evolving thing, right? They're, they're, they need to revise and update their sort of understanding of things as things evolve because things change. I imagine when, when you were playing in the seventies in college, it's very different than young women would play today. There's probably more opportunities. There's probably more funding. There's probably better amenities for women athletes. Is that? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Here's what's, here's the point that parents need to understand. Sport is an unregulated society. So as a parent, think about your lives. You just admitted you're both parents Monday through Friday. You are, fanatical about car insurance, life insurance, health insurance, but then not necessarily you guys. Hmm? Then the parent on Saturday morning drops their precious cargo, their daughter to chuck in a truck that doesn't know the first thing about anything that has to do with leadership, failure recovery, player holdness. It's not their fault. God bless them. They raise their hand, but because it's unregulated, parents turn off their discerning mind. Yes. And say, why wouldn't you ask the same questions of the youth coach that you asked the insurance policy guy? Right. Why don't we? Right. And until the parents have an uprising, it's just going to be a money grab, youth sport. Uh, and it is. It is right now. You brought a failure recovery. And when you and I looked at the, uh, the flow cycle, recovery is the, one of the stages of, of the flow cycle there. I believe it's a struggle release flow and recovery. Um, can you walk us through what you mean by that and maybe apply it towards both uh, the, what our kids are going through now at, as teenagers and as Division One athletes and then all the way through pros? Why it's important? Yeah, let me first just back up. What's mm -hmm. so exciting, where I get excited and where I've learned so much in the last five to seven years around flow science is giving language mm -hmm. to way before and way after failure recovery. So for us, we've been working, because I was raised that way. I'm a daughter of a military father. He stormed the beaches of Normandy. So I lived a world of you better own the process and no yes. one sits in their junk. So for us at UCLA, it was a station. They come into UCLA, station number seven is a failure recovery station. For the first time in your life, you're going to own my bad and then shut your pie hole. Yeah. We've raised them to have such a voice around, oh, I didn't get it done because my brother's uncle, sister's cousin didn't pick me up on time and teaches the brain everything's okay around being average. Mm -hmm. Instead, if we celebrate that you go through the process, for us, we always wanted to say in and out quickly, mm -hmm. in and out of the failure quickly. This idea of anti-fragility, we're going to get mm -hmm. in, we're going to get out and be elevated because we're a little bit smarter. Right. Page number seven, we actually make the odds of succeeding so, so low. They have to practice. And so for our we were, had attention to detail. There was a lot of rigor involved regarding softball. You're actually going to, however you want to do it, but if you can't figure out a model, here's one for you. Mm -hmm. And remember now, like golf, softball, we have more time in between plays. Two pats of the chest. Audible, my bad. Mm -hmm. Give the outs, point to a teammate. I'm owning it. I'm going to own it. I'm going to say I own it. And then I'm going to give the outs that says I've already... I've already in, in, intellectualized it. I know where we are. There's two outs. We've got a runner at third. And I check in with a the teammate. They want to know I'm okay. I'm good. Now, boom, we get that done in about 2.5 seconds. Now right. everybody's back and in alignment as a team, not around everybody's thinking the same thing. I'm not a big believer in that. And Ponch, we talked about that before. Team dynamics are different than individuals. So this is an individual dynamic that we used. So you can get in and out quickly, just like at bats. We go through another set of prompts when we're going in between pitches, but they learn that language and they realize failure and success 
they hold hands. You can't have one without the other. Grow up. This is interesting. You bring up it's an individual construct potentially. I'm, I'm seeing it as a du there's a duality to it where if I own a failure, it's doing something to me cognitively, and it's doing something where we can talk about either blending egos, building that trust, creating that psychological safety. Are, are you saying that it, it, it serves two purposes? Uh, it serves two purposes. It's sir. Oh, look at you. Look at Ponch. I have no idea stuff? where they came from. Come on. I love for it. Everybody who's listening to this, uh, some balloons just went across my desk. I don't know how that happened. Uh, yeah. But wasn't Ponch, is, Ponch mm -hmm. is partying over there, everybody. Yeah, Another yeah. side of Ponch. Here we yeah. go. Uh, yes, I do agree. There is a um, a scaling effect that helps the, the, the group intel. Uh, mm -hmm. As a whole, I meant I want to be very careful that I'm not saying everybody needs to think alike, say alike, speak alike, because great. My interest now as a consultant is around team dynamics. I'm mm -hmm. really interested in teaching individuals how to navigate the huge contradiction mm -hmm. around individual greatness and mm -hmm. team greatness because right. they contradict each other. And I love getting into the mess of that. Yeah. No, no, we could dive into that here in, in, a, in a minute as well. Uh, but back to the uh, failure recovery, is that, I want to build on that some more. By, in the military, we would talk about uh, when you do an effective debrief as a leader, you're showing fallibility, that you make mistakes as a human. You know that I did, I know I did something wrong. Everybody knows I did something wrong. I'm going to make sure everybody's aware of that. And that creates the ability for us to uh, reconstruct the past, uh, understand what happened as a team so we can improve future team performance. And that's what we're trying to do there with effective retrospectives, that recovery method or recovery uh, point in a, in a flow cycle. Is that similar to what uh, you did in the past or, or where would we differ on, on this uh, type of thinking? Yeah, that from from both an individual and a, and a team mm -hmm. and a coaching, we, you know, we do the AARs. I mean, every single yeah. day we would do those and have them be able to move through them quickly. Where I think it's unique, a lot of teams that don't do it is they've never thought about making failure recovery a skill, an X's and O's station, yeah. because we're already assuming the athletes coming in whole. And remember, my, my bias is around high performance. Mm -hmm. And where we're getting it wrong is we're assuming because you were so phenomenal, you were an honor student and you're the, you know, we're, we're looking at the top 18 players in the country. We're assuming they're whole and it's just the opposite because mm. they've been taught failure is bad. They've been taught that if it's bad, then the brain's got to negotiate the fear issues. So instead we're saying fail fast, fail hard, fail a lot. But by golly, you better not sit in it or you'll be on the bench. So we had a really, really rigid um, responsibilities around how long you sit in your junk because they learn very early. We're so deep as a team. Yeah. If you can't figure it out between the white lines, we have somebody in the dugout that's chomping at the bit to show yeah. their failure recovery. Let's connect this to flow because I think there's something here. When we talk about being present, does this type of failure recovery allow you to move on? Is that what it's doing? Well, then you've got to do the, you got to do the, you got to front load to make sure that they understand their wholeness. If they're, if I'm not mm -hmm. whole as a person mm -hmm. in terms of how I see myself, how I speak about myself, both internally and externally, failure recovery is not going to work a bit. So mm -hmm. they first, we first put them through an individual audit, long-term athletic development plan, where they go and they see where the separation from their themselves to their identity as a player. And they actually pinpoint, there it was, ninth grade, There that happened in 11th grade is where I actually left my whole self behind. And all I did was become a swimmer or a soccer player or a basketball player. Once we can pinpoint that, now we can go ahead and reconstruct and get that back because we teach them if they can get that back, this actually will be, this we call it hashtag love hard. You're mm -hmm. gonna love the good tension. You're going to love, tension can be a good thing, right? And I know both of you believe in that. So for us, mm -hmm. we have to first do the individual audit to make sure they're whole, then get into m massively successful failure recovery processes. Okay. I want to move over to the type of coaching. And I've read this before, that constraints-led approach where you actually create the conditions that they're going to see in a game. You don't, it's the way you want to coach or create the environment for them. Is, is that how you coached as well as... Um, it's not about well, the activity. Get, yeah. We want to give context to like our younger coaches out there. The first thing we have to do is we have to, we have to measure their, their overall movement, how their, their mm -hmm. functional movement, how they put their gears together. Then we evaluate 
their technical skills in how they put the gears together. Then we see if they have the timing and the decision making on their mm-hmm. tactical skills. Then we can go into that next phase. So for me, it's really kind of understanding all of those things first. So within the OODA loop, and I'll let Mark talk a little bit more about this. We talk about implicit guidance and control, the technical skills, the, you know, that muscle memory, you know, mind body movement, the proprioception, that capability there. That is something that a, a good process, the way I understand it, can be uh, applied to teaching kids at a younger age if they shoot a basketball correctly or have a good approach to shooting a basketball, how they use both legs in, in soccer. Uh, and, and there's other examples out there, even swim with your fingers open, which is a flow thing, by the way, it's just kind of cool. Um, I don't know if you know that Mark, but when you spread your fingers open, you create a hand glove there, uh, which gives you a, it's a flow system. Um, but I do want to know, you know, as, as kids progress into, uh, you know, from teenager to being looked at for, uh, a university, maybe div, div one, div two, div three, uh, how do you. How do you coach those kids at this level? Um, what, what are we looking for? Well, I, I, we've got great science on this around mm-hmm. long-term athletic development. Mm-hmm. We're, what we know now is the longer we can keep, get them, keep them in unstructured play for them to be able to pick up the nuances of the game naturally, unstructured, no instruction is really, we're finding is a really huge asset now. And then this is where we get lost. We have volunteer coaches are responsible for biomechanical movement. So what's happening is the, and I know this sounds like Sue's bashing youth coaches to all the youth coaches. Thank you for doing all the hard work. Thank you for your service. But we also, we also have to hold ourselves accountable. The system is broken. Mm -hmm. So when you look at us as a country, our results, medals, crushing it. Number two in the world. When it comes to our process, we're 57 in the world in terms of national governing bodies. So for us, how we go about doing it is first being able to understand the youth coach needs to understand, are they in a huge growth phase? We have Mm -hmm. two huge growth phases. We have a six year developmental gap in age-based sports. We have a six year developmental gap. So if you're a swimmer that is eight and under swimming, that means developmentally there's a five-year-old there and an 11-year-old. We all can picture it. Anybody watch the World Series? You got a pitcher on the mound that has a beard Mm -hmm. and you have a a four foot seven hitter. So nothing illegal. It's just the development gap. That's number one. Number two is do I understand the basic fundamentals of a kinetic chain? The kinetic chain, people forget you have to add timing into that. Mm -hmm. game speed timing. So you have youth coaches trying to fix a technical skill when in reality, they are not picking up the pitch soon enough and they're rushing. Mm -hmm. This is, if you said, Sue, if you could throw a mic to the whole world, what would it be? Mm -hmm. Please understand, just Google functional movement, tactics, speed, and timing. So you understand, are they in a technical hole deficit, a technical deficit? Mm -hmm. They can't get their elbow in line with their hip. Or are they late getting there? Mm. So it looks wrong. This is the number one problem we have in, in my opinion, from a science background is we are not factoring in game speed, timing element. They actually have a beautiful technical swing. It's their timing. And the only way you can do that is you got to put them into game situations. But most coaches don't want to do that because you don't get a lot done during that time because the game will only go so fast. I'm going to go ahead and let them hit off the machine. I'm going to get 300 swings. Perfect. Yeah. Do you think, now they can't manage the, t- the tactical part. Do you think that um, in what you're describing, though, I mean, do you think that there's been in, in this modern epoch of, of athletics, especially for kids, that there's too much over specialization? And what I mean by that, by contrast, when we were all kids, you know, I had a fall sport, a winter sport, a summer sport, a spring sport and a summer sport. And that developed range and repertoire. And then I found out when I went to high school, I was a great lacrosse player and I just played lacrosse. I, you know, I stopped playing baseball, basketball and football and other things. I mean, do you, do you see that or do you see more of an over-specialization? Yes, definitely. So it's a bell-shaped curve, right? So on the right side of the bell-shaped curve, the best of the best, there are some that survive out of that and they are very successful. What we're finding overall in high performance sports that they didn't early specialize, that they had 
uh, a variety in their experience and still made it to the top. Now, we understand the specialization has to occur at, mm -hmm. at some point. People always ask me, at what age should she start being on a travel team? I'm like, well, you're going to have to show me her long-term athletic development graph, and I'll tell you exactly when she should do it. But everybody is a snowflake. Everybody's different, and parents need to be responsible about where their child is in their long-term in their long-term athletic development as a body and their body of experience in sport. You know, we, I read the book, uh, Range, I think it's by uh, David Epstein. Am I reading that right? Why, journal, when, why Journalists Triumph in a Specialized World. I don't know if it's actually by Epstein or not. Yeah, David um, Epstein. It may or may not be from him or, at all. But anyway, the, the concept is exactly the same thing. It's take a journalist approach at a younger age, and you hear about different athletes who uh, are great at what they do today. They, they didn't start off that way. They played soccer. They played basketball. They played baseball. They swam. And then now today, they're great tennis stars. So uh, that's what the research is saying is it, it supports everything you just pointed out there, at least the way we understand it is there's no need to specialize at, at, uh, at my daughter's age anyway, 13 or 14. Right. Okay. You talked about in that book about like, you know, Tiger Woods was designated from birth to be a golfer and that's all he did. Mm -hmm. Whereas Roger Federer, who had a very famous mother, um, who was a very famous tennis coach, he allowed him to play soccer and basketball and skateboard and do all, all sorts of other things. And then eventually but, he came back to tennis at the time that all of his peers that had, that had been specializing were burning out. Yeah. And, and as somebody that I believe the teaching aspect and understanding how the athlete develops overall. So when you have these hugely successful documentaries mm -hmm. as a teacher and a leader, I cringe because I'm like, no, oh, a whole nother generation of parents that think their kid has to be kicking a soccer ball competitively at age five, because we now have five and under national championships. We now have six and under world series, national championships, six and under. Yeah. It's phenomenal. What's going on in sports today. I, I came across a quote recently from uh, Sally Jenkins book, the right call. It's a great book. Uh, Don't mistake activity for achievement practice the right way. And that's from uh, uh, John Wooden. And I think that's somebody that you may know. Um, we have a 10,000 hour rule that may have been uh, debunked as well. They're going back to Tiger Woods sitting for 10,000 hours. And I tell my girls this all the time, hey, just because you're doing something uh, for a large amount of time, doesn't mean you're doing it right. Uh, so can, can you talk a little bit about uh, doing the right thing right? Yeah, first, once again, I'm, you're going to see my bias is at the parents, right? Because they mm -hmm. create the conditions, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is a uh, youth sport today with our parents. We've decided to have behavior on a week-to-week -week basis that is dropping too much money, too much time, too much cognitive load, too much physical load on something that is all about a lottery ticket, and we're going to win that lottery ticket called an athletic scholarship. People are going to say, well, I'm not that into the scholarship. I just want my athlete to play. That means that they're still in the, the naive experience as a parent. We don't really care about Susie uh, doing any type of scholarship. We don't really care. Good, stay in that because that's going to last about two years, and then you're going to meet one family that's on a travel ball team, and you're going to get sucked into that vortex. Because the majority of our families try to gravitate to that travel ball experience. So for me, it's about work smart as a parent first and then create those opportunities where you're going to actually start to ask the athlete, do you want to do a little bit more? And it is a slippery slope. I want to give credit to the parents. This is the art part of parenting. There are times where your athlete doesn't want to do the extra work, but then when she's 18, she's going to regret it. Right. Yeah. But let me tell you, let me tell you something. I'm going to say it's eight to nine to one that the parents I deal with regret they push too hard. Okay. There's going to be that one parent that goes, oh, should have pushed her harder. Nope. 80, 90% of the parents have regrets that sit in. I got caught up in the noise. Don't forget now, less than 1% get a scholarship in the sport of their choice to hmm. the school of their liking. Less than 1%, but no one is selling that because the NC2A doesn't want you to know the math. Mm -hmm. They don't want, cause it's a business, right? So we right. wanna sell the dream all the way up through high school. But here's the reality. Parents would never, we're gonna spend $15,000 this year on lottery tickets. Cause we think we're gonna win the billion dollars. Parents are like, I'm never gonna do that. I go, yeah. you do it every month. Mm -hmm. It's called youth soccer. Can you shape can you shape sports as a way to help kids do a couple things? One, stay away from 
technology. Uh, try to avoid that, avoid social media. And then two, use it as a way to help them understand the importance of academics. I mean, how do you feel about that, that approach? And, and if so- well, I just, I, I still, having said that, I mean, you can sense my passion is I'm on the front mm -hmm. lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right. You I know. mean, if, if you can just, as a parent, read the statistics, you read the stats in life insurance and car insurance. Why are we dropping the on school? My goodness, mom and dad are down there with the principal going a, a, a crazy because the mm -hmm. math standard's not being hit. Mm -hmm. But the brain is off on new sport. So yes, yeah, sport is a hugely important. It is, I always say, it is the greatest leader for a young human outside the parents, if the parents are doing their job. Parents are doing their job, they should be number one. But here's the unfortunate, studies now show. This generation right now, mm -hmm. Gen, what are they called? Gen A now. Gen A is the first generation that their number one influencer is the internet. Wow. It's no longer the parent. All right, let's talk about high performing teams in, in uh, college sports. Uh, what you've seen in the past and what you're seeing today, you and I kind of talked about this the other day where, uh, yeah, I, I, things like alcohol, uh, the consumption of alcohol at the professional level before our, a game, uh, the wearables, uh, that type of, you know, how's technology, how's better understanding of the body, uh, the mind or the brain uh, gut connection. How's that starting to play into sports? And again, I think this connects into a lot of concepts you and I learned about uh, flow. Yeah. And, and now my work is predominantly with our national teams and our professional teams. I love this level because they really are tapped into the nuance around analytics. Are they perfect at it? No, but they understand we've got to figure out the fit. And what we now, what we've learned in the last 10 years, this is at the NGB level, okay? The national governing body level. These, for those of you who don't know NGB, the NGB of each sport is responsible for the rules of the sport, picking the Olympic teams, our national teams. So they represent our, our, the world, our country to the world. What I love is they're starting to see the importance of customization. So 10 years ago, when we started getting wearable technology, everybody just got slapped the same thing, got slapped the same answers. Now we're able to read this like an F1 dashboard and they're really starting to create the conditions when you think you know mark i think about you when i talk about this because swimming you know they've got it dialed now i know they're training controversies regarding swimming you know like gymnastics but if all sports could get into swimming and gymnastics and track and field and learn from them from a individual sport basis collectively all sports would get better. So I love the idea that we're using technology around sleep, around recovery. The fact that alcohol now, you know, this generation coming up that Poncho and I were talking about this, the fastest growing uh, beverage in restaurants and bars is non-alcoholic beer. So we know it's coming. They understand the huge effects of it. Whereas 10 years ago, my gosh, those poor young athletes just couldn't wait, you know, 20 years ago, we party from 10 to five in college. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then we, you know, now we're going to go ahead and binge it 10 to 12. Now you're finding they're not big binger, big drinkers. It's coming. So I get excited about how we're connecting gut health, everything mm -hmm. that goes into our stomach, including alcohol, and how it's translating. And the science is now sharing with us our ability to have quicker reaction time, better yeah. sleep, all those get into flow, in and out of flow more efficiently. So I get excited about the future on this national governing body level. When I was in the uh, world of fighter aviation, we were max performing aircraft, right? I even flew air shows. Uh, alcohol was, it's part of the culture. Um, I'm not sure if it is today. And, and you know, going back to that, uh, the wearables where we saw in the military, EOD teams were wearing um, devices and they'd go out on a Friday night and it would tell them how they would perform three or four days out. And it kind of shifted the culture there away from drinking. And, and so it wasn't, uh, I don't think what it was like 20 years ago, it's not like it's, I'm sorry, it's not today. It's not like it was 20 years ago where everybody was drinking all the time from, again, from my perspective, and I see the same thing in sports. So here we are watching NHL, we're watching NBA. Uh, these teams are max performing every other day, basically. They, how do they get through those couple of days in the recovery mode uh, and, and going back to nutrition and the coaching what's happening in that space? Well, if, first of all, in the team space, team by team, right? Every national governing body has, you know, for example, let's talk, I'm working, I'm embedded with USA Volleyball. Okay. So they have six disciplines, right? You got beach, 
you have indoor and you have para, right? So men and women, six disciplines. But in those six disciplines, there's over 20 teams because it's by age group, right? So how do we scale all those teams? Very, very difficult. That's why NGBs are struggling because they don't have the funding to take care of everybody. So what I'm about to tell you, I'm not assuming everybody does this because I'm in, I've seen our national teams in multiple sports, but this is, here's what the best are doing in my opinion. The coaching staff is in alignment with strength, sports med and mental performance and mental health. So we're now splitting those, right? So, you know, up until gosh, five, seven years ago, it was mental health and mental performance sat inside of it. So think clinical psychologists who have a great expertise around mental health with all due respect to that industry, mental performance is completely different. And so now at the high performance level, our big programs that have a lot of money on the national level and colleges, they've split those. So now we're normalizing people that have to manage mental health. Think day-to-day -day performance, anxiety, ideation, depression. We're now building conditions for those parents out there that have that kid that has that. We're now building conditions for them. And then team-wide, we're turning mental performance into hygiene. Everybody's going to go through a process. They're all going to be customized because they all get in and out of flow, we're finding differently. I wanted to shift gears to uh, to leadership, um, and I wanted to stay in the realm of women's sports, inter intercollegiate sports, if we can. So, so you you are the second Division One women's athletic coach that we've had on the show. The first one was uh, Digit Murphy, that was the uh, head coach of Brown women's ice hockey for many many years, and it was right around then NBA and hockey playoff time too. And one of the things I learned from Digit and one of the things I observed when I was in corporate America, uh, that when I talked about things like flow and UDA and complexity, I always felt that women were more interested uh, in, the, in the business world than men were. And in, in being friends with Digit and knowing what um, she had been studying about uh, women in, in, the, in the professional world, um, there were some very alarming statistics. You know, there were uh, there were more more men named Dave leading S and P five hundred companies than than there were women. Um, but when you stripped out all of the C suites, and you looked at the women in the C suites, the overwhelming majority of them were former women collegiate athletes, inter, inter, intercollegiate athletes, and that the edge that a a woman intercollegiate athlete has a young woman in college, you know, that's, that's playing intercollegiate sports. The edge that she has over her peers is, uh, is significant. And I wanted to get your take on that because again, there, there's, there's sort of two angles. There's the women are attracted to these things, flow, decision-making and chaos, nonlinear environments and women intercollegiate athletes have a even further edge that's, that's trackable with data in the business world. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I think that we first have to go back to the science. We know the brains are different. That's number one. So uh, this conversation can go sideways because it, it could sound like we're genderizing. And we, all, we have to genderize uh, this because we have to first start the brain is different. The pathways are different. We know, right? So oftentimes the simplified saying is, you know, men have, uh, you know, <laughs> a, a freeway and women have a bird's nest of roads that are capable of intertwining and they're really comfortable with chaos, which is true. I see it as more about, and because I see it when I deal with men, is it's easier to get in and get messy with the chaos with women but we have our own impediments and that is we're like gunpowder. So if we're locked and loaded and we understand, we have an awareness about what we're picking up, we call it frequency. If we're aware of all that frequency, gunpowder, we could shoot lasers. If we're not aware of that and we don't know how to work flow science, it will blow up in your face. But with guys, People will say, oh, well, guys, you know, they're, they're not as complicated. Actually, I'm finding, and I know this is going to wake up a lot of people and they're going to get all ruffled. So I, I hear you. Please don't blow up my, my inbox. But this is what I want to share with you. In the last 20 years, I'm finding men to be more androgynous towards the female side than they were 40 years ago. And science backs that. We now know that the overall 
testosterone levels of men has decreased overall as a gender it has decreased and they're attributing that to environment what we're eating all that kind of stuff so if we first start there that both genders have a positive and a negative and the the teams men and women that i work with that are more tuned for me it's just being tuned in to what toolkit i need in the moment those are the teams that do extremely well whether it be male or female the most important work we're not doing with our females is we're not doing an audit of when they lost their identity we're not doing that audit and we don't do an audit on that and have have an honest conversation first with ourselves build safety I'm big on anonymous stuff until we build the emotional safety. I, I deal with coaches all the time. They say, I go, tell me, this is my first question. How's your culture? I've never heard a coach say, oh, it, it's crappy. I've never heard a coach say that because we're so yeah. early in my career. I'd say our culture is perfect. Now that I look back, it was a shit show. Yeah. Yeah. Now that I look back and I know what perfect actually looks like or close to perfect, if we can first do anonymous stuff so we find out exactly where we are what is our state of mind right now as a group mm -hmm. then i become your co-conspirator in getting better absolutely and not your your leader so to me if coaches and leaders can first go there and i say what holds your team back you know what the first thing they say right out of that i don't know i've never asked them yeah yeah so, so let's get, let's become more transformational as a leader. For me, people always say, well, how do you define transformational versus transactional? Super simple. Mm -hmm. I first listen, I take the information and lift up the group intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. And then we, we, we literally go through that cycle every single week. We're listening and we're learning. And then the ultimate, if we're doing it right, we end up lifting the entire group's experience. And if you have talent, you get to win. It right. all starts with talent. But if you have the talent and you're transformational with your individuals, first I'm going to build up your wholeness because I then have to be a contradiction and tell you you have to be aware of when to go in your ego and when to go out. You got to mm -hmm. go in and out of your ego hundreds of times during a right. game. Yeah. Uh, let's, this is amazing. We can go in many directions here on sense making, red teaming, the stuff that we use in organizations, how we understand culture. I want to go back to the ego point. Uh, I think during our, our course, we, we talked about uh, mission focus and ego focus, and you just brought up, you got to go in and out. So, so there are times in a performance uh, where you're going to be ego focused uh, and more so than mission focused. So internally focused more so than mission focused. Can you talk a little bit more about that when it comes to uh, high performing individuals and teams? Yeah. And I, I'm going to, it's going to sound broad brush ish mm -hmm. because I don't want to get into the sports I deal with, I don't want to talk about soccer and softball and, yeah. and volleyball because you might be a swimmer, right? Right, right? But at the end of the day, this is what we know. When the player, first of all, they, uh, they've got their anchors of their individual efficacy locked and loaded. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, they have the toolkit for that. And then they go through and they audit their game when they're in ego and out of ego. Now they have a map, a roadmap of mm -hmm. their sport when they're in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. And now it's almost more like um, it's an orchestra that now happens because everybody understands they're in and out of their ego. Then we have group conversation about that because we've got to make sure that we have the team actually in alignment, like they're actually saying the same thing mm -hmm. when they're out of their ego. We've got to make sure we don't have too many people saying, I'm in my ego at that point. And 80% of the team is like, no, 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 dude. No, no. This is when we put our ego on the shelf. You've got to put, you got to pluck out people that don't quite have, ah, uh, this is when I'm out of my ego. So let me be real specific. Diamond sports. Mm -hmm. Okay. Diamond sports. I'm the number four hitter. I hit home runs. I hit RBIs, run batted in. That's my role. Now we're down by one with a runner at second. Mm -hmm. We know that there are people on the team that are meant to do the bunt, a little tap of the ball mm -hmm. onto the infield. If I don't get out of my ego and look and know coach is going to call for a bunt, mm -hmm. we're screwed because they're going to go in there and swing big. The player, the, the opponent knows how to set that up. Mm -hmm. That's kind of situational awareness. Yeah. This is when I'm out of my ego. I'm going to do what's being asked of me, not what I want to do. Hundreds of times during the game, we have to do that.
and some sports extremely fast. Other sports, you know, in our game, we have 32 minutes in between at bats. Yeah. yeah. So you got to learn when to get out of your ego, or if you stay in your ego in those, you know, 31 minutes, you'll never be a great diamond sports person. Never. Wow. That's you'll great never point. make it. You'll yes. never make that's, it. That's, that's so being right. selfless is, is critical in, in all, in everything. In, in... Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not a big thing around selfless. I, okay. I, self-aware, I, right? Or just high yeah, self-aware because <laughs> selfless means no self. So I don't, gotcha. I don't like, I, I'm not a big, and I'm not a big one on confidence either. I don't like the word confidence mm-hmm. uh, because socially people, if you talk to people that are 18 and younger, they're going to say, yeah, you've got, you project the win. Mm-hmm. You're confident. Yeah. I actually, if you define it, if you look in the dictionary, it means certainty, but it's mm-hmm. gotten a bad rap. So I yeah. stay away from it. Yeah. And I just say, I need mental regulation. I don't even talk about toughness. That's a results oriented word. Mm-hmm. I, all I need you to be is ready for the moment. In softball, there's 95 moments, 95 pitches. I need you to be ready for the moment. That makes me feel like I don't have to be that big. Yeah. I just have to meet a moment. I don't have to strike out 18 people. I just have to meet a moment. And so for me, all it's all about awareness. It's all about readiness and failure recovery. So the word process is coming up a lot in the uh, late, especially around the word teaming. Teaming is a, the, the process of teamwork. So how do you work together as a high performing organization? That's one thing we coach right now is how, how you do that in an organization. We borrow from team science and aviation crew resource management. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, team science in sports and how you bring individuals together to be a team and what that actually uh, looks like today? What do you mean by team science? You mean uh, the evidence? It's behind what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, the evidence that supports the 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 positive, the good the good practices behind teamwork. Uh, this is um, there's only a handful mm-hmm. to be honest with you because the rest is uh, phony science. Yep. This is what I know to be true regarding great teams. It's not about you keeping an eye on what it's supposed to look like in the team. It's building a team that says this is what really good looks like in a shit show. Yep. But what we're doing, we're having these culture, oh, we're going to go away for three days. We're going to carry tires. We're going to have candles. And there's this, and it's great because we know the dopamine, right? It's like, oh, that's amazing. That's an event. Right. What we need to do is have leaders. If you are the regional manager, you're the VP, you better create environments two, three times a day that says, I'm rewarding your process in our shit show. Yeah, so this it. idea, the people that are mastering uncertainty are crushing it. Mm-hmm. I've dealt with a group, uh, they're rising stars in the company. This was early in the week. I cannot believe how the leaders are front loading everything. They are teaching them and celebrating them. Not, oh my gosh, you took this team and you made everybody one and we hit our third quarter numbers. Mm-hmm. It actually sounds like this. Oh my gosh, we were at the bottom. We're still at the bottom, but we retained our top talent for the last two years. Yeah. It's a complete different mindset mm-hmm. around building the bricks on process of enjoying and valuing uncertainty. That's the reality. If you're talking to a 22 year old, teach me how to get excited about uncertainty. Cause right now it makes me not want to get out of bed and I'm going to quit my job every, what is it? 15 months now I'm going to yeah. quit the job because I've been taught mm-hmm. what great teams look like and I haven't recognized it. So I'm leaving. I mean, you can use a surfing example because the ocean is about as uncertain as it gets. And you never you got that right. you get in your, your repertoire and your knowledge and your you understanding that right. and your ability to reorient and make faster decisions and shape. It, you, you, you take what the ocean gives you and you and you approach it that way, not, hey, the ocean's going to do exactly this because it never does. Yeah. And it's just this, this front loading from front loading is a big thing for me in teaching teams and teaching individuals is when I walk down on that sand, I am humbled because there's no off switch with the ocean right there's no guarantees either no guarantee just like when you're in a clown car of a company thank you all (laughs) you 22 to 42 year olds that can document you're in a clown car Mm -hmm. thank you Mm -hmm. that got us nowhere who is the person that's going to go aab with their group, well, Sue, I'm just a first line sales guy. Yeah, pack somebody, dude. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Go above and beyond. You might have to do an extra phone call. You want to, Sue, I want to step out and I want to, I want my bosses to recognize it. You want to be recognized? Go above and beyond. 
Don't yeah. point the finger, Captain Obvious. We have enough of them in this world. Yeah. Uh, when we were in training, you, or I think we were in a coaching session, you brought up uh, a phrase you use. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get it wrong, but it goes something like this. Uh, it looks like this. It doesn't look like that. Um, yep. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we do this as young as we can. We want people to understand right now society is doing a great job of dream making, dream building. This is what they can acknowledge. Yep, to be a great leader, I need to be positive. I was positive. You need to be able to be resilient. I was resilient one time. Then what we do is we say, what doesn't it look like? Because you know what I have found? And, and I'm not cynical. I am so excited about this generation. I really am. Mm -hmm. We never talk about what it doesn't look like. Average doesn't know they're average. Right. Because average says, I was positive one time. Mm -hmm. But now you say, hey, you know what it doesn't look like? When you're down by one, you get quiet in the dugout. There you go. When your team loses, you're complaining about the teammate and the coaches, the weather, the equipment, your friends. Yeah. That's what it doesn't look like. Now average says, crap, that's me. So to me, it looks like it doesn't look like is an important framework starting yeah. at a young age. Yeah. So we, we talk about behavioral markers inside of team science where basically it goes like this. Teamwork is observable. Therefore, it can be measured. And we can have exactly what you talked about and say, use a marker, which allows people to understand where they are. So with my girls, when I see their head down and you can see the body language, right? So I imagine body language is it doesn't look like that, right? That's, or, or it looks like, you know, that, that's a good indicator there is what's going on in the team. So we can use these inside of organizations to tell them what good looks like and what bad looks like. And I've had the same experience with a Fortune 20 company where they marked themselves as a high performing team. And we sat down with them and went through the markers and they found out they, they, weren't, even a, they weren't even a team, right? They, they had all these things that said, this is what we look like right now. And they were able to move forward with that. So uh, I think what you shared with me today and what you shared with us in the past is spot on. And it's, it's pretty simple, isn't it? It's just amplify the good and dampen the bad. Uh, well, Papa Wooden, Papa Wooden used to, Coach Wooden used to always say, boy, the most difficult thing is when you know everything is to try to simplify it for everyone. Ooh, that's a great one. That's right. Great. So the hardest yeah. thing to do is to simplify it, to be able to hold everybody accountable. You know, I have so much... Yeah. I have so much respect for our USA volleyball team because mm -hmm. we've built in teammate ship analytics and people say, oh, we do analytics for us because we're small enough, right? We only mm -hmm. have 23, 24 players. They build in the micro behaviors yeah. pre in and post everything that they do. And then they define that on the court, right? Service yeah. line, huddle, sub line in the box, which is the bench micro behaviors. And then we celebrate what you are and what you're not. We celebrate what you're not and you're going to acknowledge what you're working on. And I know hmm. people are like, wait a minute, they're the best in the world. They shouldn't have to deal with that. We're, we're number two in the, in the world, mm -hmm. but we don't have the top three players in the world. We have to out team the world. And so this idea of team unity is, and everybody uses that word team unity. Mm -hmm. I don't know a team in the world that's doing what they're doing. I have so much admiration for them. And, and then to be able to have a razor thin margin for error because everyone's mm -hmm. expecting, you know, we're in our launch to Paris. Everyone is expecting, oh, they're going to win a gold medal. They don't realize the margins are so thin, right. but we actually let them rate each other because we want them to get comfortable with learning mm -hmm. and not taking it emotionally as a negative. So we front load and we said, look it, if you still are afraid of this assessment, it means you're in your ego. If you're not afraid of it, you're in mastery. So mastery, we always sit in mastery. We never arrive. Players, people always say, well, what does that profile of that iconic player look like? The iconic player, not the one that's won a million championships. I'm talking about the iconic one that has the talent, has the numbers, has the results, has the teammate ship. That player, they are so fanatical and curious about getting better. Hmm. They don't care who's telling them. It could be the eighth grader that said, I watched you practice, Jordan Larson, yeah. and it didn't look like you were hustling. And she's going to say, where did you not see me hustle? Because I'm trying to work on my mm -hmm. micro behavior around hustle. They never attach their ego to the result or the perception. Yeah. They just say, what do I need to do to get better? To mm -hmm. me, that's inspiration. From the broad panacea of all sport that the listeners would be able to relate to, in other words, you know, famous athletes, like who do you, who would you say were the best that kind of characterized or capitalized that like your top three or four or five? Yeah. So from a, from a celebrity sport, I, people ask me that often, Mark, I never state that because mm -hmm. all I see is in front of the curtain. 
Mm. Right. So people are going to say this guy, this guy, this guy. And I'm going to say, I want to see behind the curtain. Yeah. I want to see how, how he grew or was he just the go-to everybody shut up and put up. Mm. But I can tell you on the women's side, mm. I can tell you on the women's side, like right now, I, Jordan Larson to me is one of our greatest iconic athletes that's in mastery, constantly trying to get better. She would get on the podcast and say, I'm still not there yet. Mm. And yet she's literally weeks away from possibly becoming a four-time Olympian, right? So I can go on women's side a little bit more, but I would have to be behind the curtain. So I know them at their worst. How are they? Hmm. So it's easy. It's easy to look at, oh, so-and-so is all it, but I don't really know because I'm not behind that curtain. Yeah. And I guess it also too probably relies on a lot of anecdotal evidence and things like say Kobe Bryant. I mean, he he was, he's anecdotally from what others say that he was extremely intense, you know, as you say, behind the curtain. Um, that's I, I mean that's kind of like what I was thinking about like that sort of a thing not not whoever cleans up the most championships because to your point you, yeah you don't really know what's going and on and when you like let's talk about in front of the curtain yeah. right when when you say Kobe Bryant what's my first quick response that is your model for rigor yeah. rigor is a disciplined determined attention to detail yeah. this generation needs to learn that word they don't this generation doesn't know that word because they're swipe and go because mm-hmm. of social media well they they when you 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 probably know this your parents right you, you actually can't say something one time it has to be reiterated multiple times more than ever before mm-hmm. and that's because they're in the swipe and go right they're swipe and go on their social media everything is quick scans but when you talk about Kobe, I, I think rigor. He is a he is a role model for rigor. He has this relentlessness around the attention to detail. And his discipline is next level. I don't know the man. I just know what I saw publicly to watch what he did in behind this behind the competition window to see what he did Monday through Friday. I have seen that firsthand. To me, that's where I I don't say iconic athlete in terms of technical, tactical, failure recovery, and teammateship, because I don't know the teammateship. I don't know how he manages failure right. because only the people on the team know that. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, you know, that, that's, that's really fascinating. Um, because I also, do you think that you can see when these athletes, when they say things uh, publicly, like maybe in a press conference or whether can you determine, like say Kobe Bryant, for example, when he was still with us, like he would say, um, you know, he would be disappointed being up two to nothing in a playoff series. But we're not over yet. Like it's not over yet. And there's things that we need to be working on and we got a long way to go versus, you know, you, you hear other uh, outward projections that kind of reflect, I think, the inward projection. Yeah, I think. Uh, in general, people don't understand, like sometimes there's a part of society that says, God, Kobe, take a rest, but they just don't understand what he's looking at. He's looking at the standard of excellence, not the standard of the opponent that I'm one inch better than. Yeah. And, and athletes that have an eye on excellence are the most powerful to recruit. And you can go through an interview. It's so easy to pick it out. It's so easy to pick it out if an athlete love asking the questions so I can pick out if they have rigor in their life. So here's a question then. So you so you're familiar with the recruiting process and you know, I've gone through it as a as a parent with a child and then about to do it with two others. Do you, what are, what are like your red flags as a coach when you're, when you're looking at a kid, you know, um, you can see the numbers, you can see the data, you can see the scores or the times or whatever, and they're great. They're awesome. And then they're, they're, they're minimum to be here at whatever school. But what are the, what are the real like three red flags that you look for that say, there's no way this person's ever going to be in my organization? Well, it, it first starts from a college standpoint. And remember, my bias is I'm at UCLA. So I have to first thing I have to look at is their academics. So that's beautiful because it's objective. So I, I literally know whether they can even be in the game. The second thing is what I, I spend a lot of time with the family. So here at the, to parents, here's some, I'm retired now. So I'm going to open the curtain. All right. When we're doing things and I'm talking to your athlete, I'm actually interviewing the parents. Hmm. I'm watching where they sit. I'm watching what they're doing while the athlete is speaking. I'm listening to the tone I see in conversations. I may be asking the athlete a question about failure, but I'm actually waiting to see if I can get some tips and tools that have influenced that athlete from the parents. Oh, the parents give it, the parents have no idea they're being interviewed. 
They really don't. Overall, they do not understand. I like to give a lot of rigor to families to see if they have an attention to detail. So I'll, I'll, I would recruit athletes. Now remember, if you're the best athlete, trust me, if you're smart and you can hit, you're playing for UCLA. I'm going to just be honest. Because if you can hit at that level and be academically at that level, barely did I have families that weren't locked and loaded, locked and loaded. So it really, to me, all those other things that I don't know about came first. I see them because they're hitting the ball over the fence or they're, they've got great defense. From a parenting perspective, here are the questions. Here, here we could, You want to role play? Yeah. I'll role play. Great. Ponch, how, let's give me the profile of your athlete. Get, and then, Mark, you give me the profile of your athlete. I'll give you both 13 or 14 year old girls playing uh, AAU basketball. Technical skills are uh, about average. Mindset or headspace, about average. Awareness of the game, about average. Drive, above average. And then the younger player, and she may listen to this, by the way, this, uh, her, her she, she's naturally talented and doesn't put a lot of effort in. So that's, that's a big overview of dad looking at the daughters right now. Perfect. I wasn't interested in any of that, but I'm curious what the first thing he talks about. So what did he talk about? Performance. Mm -hmm. So give me the profile. Here's my first question to you, dad. Does she do her own laundry? Yes. Does she cook her own meals? Uh, 50, 50 now. Does she do her dishes? No. Is she a good sibling? Yes. I had to delay on that one. I'll pick one. And <laughs> okay. That's where I like to go. Okay. Nice. Nice. You see how quick he is? He has answers. He's paying attention. I mm -hmm. feel really good about that. Mm -hmm. But he tipped his hat. Mm -hmm. He tipped his hat to me as a dad. So I already know nice. his nice. daughters, yeah. I already know his daughters mm -hmm. have been impacted by winning just by the sheer fact that he broke down their physical. Yeah. Right. So Mark, we don't need to run you through the rigmarole, but you get it, yeah. right? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. And you want to be able to, as a dad, say, oh, you want to profile my daughter? This is what I'm going to tell you. I want to tell you a story about biology. And then you're going to tell me about the process of how she made biology certain during the uncertainty of it. I want or I want you to tell you. me about her kindness. Because we went down to the mall and there was a bus of our, our young children that have challenges, whether they're physical challenges, mm. they were para. Let me tell you what she did when the one kid's wheelchair was broken. Those are the things I'm looking for. Not do I recruit her. It's just, I need to know where to start. Wow. This is great. It's not a, it's not a, I'm not judging you. Yeah, I just need to know where to start. So, so I want to flip the script with you as a parent that did take a, a D1 prospect and now a D1 athlete around the colleges. The, the, the overwhelming minority of options and the one that she ended up choosing saw her as a human and saw her as a young woman. With, with, with certain potentials. And, and the opposite was, and they were more, the opposite was, I, I saw your daughter as a warm body that's going to score points, and that's all I care about. I, I really don't care mm. about her development as a woman. I really don't care about her development as a, as a leader. And they were very easy options to, to disqualify. Um, and in the program that she's at now, it was, which we, we still believe was the best for her. And she believes that, and her coach believes that, because I think it focused on her development as a, as a human. And yeah, is she, is she a number and does she put up points and, and finish in the top 10 in the conference? Yep. But that I think is a product of how she is as a person and how she's approached. So that way I would reverse the script. Do, do Are there programs that are, because this is my experience with it seemed to me, it was very easy to disqualify things and encourage her to disqualify things that didn't see her for who she is. They saw her as something that hmm. yeah, them, got not her. Great, great comment. And, and this is what I want everyone to discern from what I'm saying. I also am controversial in the sense that I don't even have a problem with a coach. I don't even judge a coach that says, hey, let me tell you something. She's a number. And I couldn't care less about her as a human. That was your job, mom and dad. You had her for 18 years. She now can vote and I think go to war. Mm -hmm. It's not my job to make her feel good about herself. If you think I can do that 20 hours a week, because we have limits, okay? So I, wanna, I want everyone to know, I have no problem with that person that's recruiting warm bodies, but here's the downside. They don't tell you. 
So I have colleagues that are like that. I have so much respect for them because in the recruiting process, they tell the parents, do not look to me to build your child's confidence. That's your job. Yeah. I mean, that's powerful stuff, right? That's well, parents are going to go, well, wait a minute. The brain is still growing until they're 28 people. Let's mm -hmm. own our responsibility. The number one influencer in a child's life is who they spend the night with every night of their life. So I'm not saying it has to be the blood parent. It's whoever the adult is mm -hmm. with them through those 18 years. This is fantastic. And that's that. Now, it's super hard for the parents because we, you're in the in the sports space and you both, especially Ponch, because he's got 14 year olds. You're going to look back at this podcast. Mm -hmm. You guys have no idea what sport is going to look like in 10 years. Right. Well, it's going to look like your corporate world. They're they, going to have. Yes. They, right. Right it's now they're protected. Nice. They're uh, protected right now. The NC2A well, is protecting them. You guys, it will not hold up in Congress anymore. Well, they're going to be employees. Well, let's, let's look at this. Uh, I know we're running short on time. So I want to lead into three questions here. First being NIL and portal and kind of where we are right now. What's that doing in the game uh, in NCAA? And I also want to talk about alignment and maybe look back at uh, what, what life was like at UCLA uh, when you're surrounded by absolute greatness, uh, your, your teams. And uh, I believe you had some connection to, uh, uh, you said Papa Wooden. Uh, so maybe, maybe look at Coach that. Wooden. Yeah, yeah. That'd be great. So NIL uh, portal, uh, what's going on in sports right now? Your thoughts. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Let, let's just, do, let's take the tippy top so people know mm -hmm. and they can start to see this, right? Mm -hmm. So you had this control with the NC2A, you had the mm -hmm. control with the administration, and now we finally have who, who, who now, our student athlete now says, you're not giving me the same rights. People on the outside are going to go, they're so spoiled. Let me put it this way. Mm -hmm. I want parents to remember this. If I'm the top basketball player on campus, I cannot get an extra job. So those students out there, they've got three, four, five jobs. The smart engineers at UCLA, they're getting paid twenty, thirty thousand dollars to go to student college camps across the country because they're so smart. Athlete, nothing. I'm on scholarship. I cannot do anything extra. Those laws are now being broken down. I am super excited and super scared. At the same time, because what I fell in love with, I know is no longer going to be here in 10 years. I know it's going to be gone and I'm preparing myself to get to, to look at sport more like corporate America. So what will happen? And I said to the athletes, be careful what you wish for, because now you're going to have to pay taxes. Now you're going to have to be compliant with HR, right? Because you're mm. now going to be a corporate employee. Oh. And then on the fixed picture, this mm. we coaching is an unregulated industry mm. coaching. You need no certification to become a coach. Guys, I went to UCLA. I became an assistant, a co-head coach, a head coach, a development director in administration, and now I'm a professor at UCLA. Mm -hmm. No certification for coaching. None. Zero. Wow. Now we're asking that guy and girl mm -hmm. to now run a Fortune 100 company called their athletic team. So there's NIL. There's mm -hmm. it today and there it is in 10 years. Transfer portal. Parents, stop getting emotional. They have rights. Mm -hmm. Get away from this. Oh, we're loyal. Once a Bruin, always a Bruin. I said to my head coach, let go of that. Start playing this game around. You've got to be able to fit your program. If someone is not happy, you don't have the time anymore yeah. to get them to get it right. I want us to stop shaming families that their athletes are picking up and leaving. We can't change that character issue. We can't mm. change that. The system tests them, right? But what I would do in the recruiting, some people say, what would you do today? I would just ask you dads, hey, if your kid doesn't play and she's unhappy, would you entertain the portal? Just let me know, because I want to have your backup ready. I'm never going to get rid of her, but I'm going to be prepared. Mm. I'm going to have an open, honest conversation in the recruiting. 90% of the colleges, I. I consult with, I say, do you have in your anonymous survey, do you have the question is, are you looking at transfer portal if you're unhappy or not playing? 90% of them don't have that in there. Wow. I said, how do you know who's going to transfer then? No. Well, we just, at the end of the season, they say they're in the portal. You don't do anything else like that. But once again, you turn your brain off with the transfer portal. It's a strategy. Stop getting your heart involved. It's a yeah. strategy today. Wow. Uh, you know, I'm a, Colorado Buffs. So we have uh, Coach Prime and, and Coach Prime, I think, can only exist in the way he exists today because of NIL and the portal. 
Um, now that's a now you've gone to the tail of the bell shaped curve yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. It, it, is what he's doing is it sustainable? Only time will tell. Right. But he's grabbed some nuggets that I think are a lot of. When you have a situation like Coach Prime, everyone needs to say what part could work for me. You want to know what is yeah. powerful with him? His brutal honesty. I'm not saying what he thinks is right, mm -hmm. but I love there is no filter. But right. Does he need to be more of a professional? All those things, all those things that people, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. But no one can discount how he's transforming the landscape of football. No one can discount that. And I'm a big, I admire people, whether they do it intentionally or not, change is never clean in the front end. You never have people go, hey guys, let's create some change. And the guys go, okay, perfect. Shake hands. And we have change. No, it's always messy. There's lots of tension on the front end regarding change. And so I think people like him are creating change. Whether you think it's a good way or a bad way is not for us to judge. And uh, your thoughts on alignment. I think you and I had a quick discussion on that and maybe you brought it up today. Alignment on teams. Uh, is there a better way to think about that? I just, Everybody defines alignment differently. So for me, mm -hmm. this idea that everybody needs to, 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 to think, speak, and act the same way, that the principles we all need to be going into is an awareness mm -hmm. around in my technical, tactical, failure recovery, and teammateship. Where am I in my ego and out of my ego? To me, those if you know those principles, we're in alignment. It doesn't mean we are agreeing. Mm -hmm. I want to work with teams that understand how to be good fighters with each other. And this idea, this is a fallacy, and people are like, well, what makes you an authority? Well, we won 11 times. Yeah, I'm a world champion. I've coached with our national team. I am familiar with what it looks like. All the parents, everybody that reads about the press conference, we went to the next level. We were so in alignment. Everybody was, no, we're not. <laughs> Nice. It's a mess. It's intense. Mm -hmm. Injuries, fighting, egos, role reversals. Coaches today have to manage so much. Stop thinking. We all have to be in alignment. But what we do have to do, we have to be aware. We have to fail and recover. We have to fight and recover. And we have to actually understand what I call the belief well. When your well gets shallow, mm -hmm. everyone's going to surround you with honey. Make sure we know how to address you to get your language back, to deepen that well again, so you can absorb the wins and losses, because I believe the game you play is perfect. Yeah. The game you play is perfect. We're the imperfect ones. So our that's why I love team sports. Our team sports can hover around you when your belief well gets empty. Yeah. That is when we have that emotional safety. You believe the words that are being told. That means we have the trust. That's the beautiful, delicious mess that I love to be a part of. Final topic for me is the, the topic of flow. And that is, uh, you know, you and I went through training on this. Uh, I have a book called The Flow System. We co-authored that, co-created that. What are your thoughts on flow? Where are things going with it? What happens next? Just, I've never said this to you, Punch, but I can remember when you first on the Zoom, I didn't know who you were and, mm -hmm. and the words that were coming out of your mouth. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to put Punch in the duplication machine and then bring him into sport and we mm -hmm. can scale this stuff, mm -hmm. right? Because flow, if families, youth sport could just understand front loading, how you get into that flow, just don't complicate it. My mind and my body are together and I lose track of time and I kind of happy doing it. Know how to get into it. Know when you're stuck, when you get out, how you take care of yourself, and then just do that cycle your entire life. It needs to be as we end this podcast, as we started it. Flow science needs to be in the X's and O's, technical and tactical. It needs to be hygiene. It needs flow, mm -hmm. also known as breathing. Mm -hmm. We would never decide whether we're going to breathe today. We should never decide if we're not paying attention to flow six, eight, 10 times a day to reset ourselves and do our state management. I think we got to end it there. That was just amazing, Sue. I appreciate Perfect. your time. Unbelievable. You bet. Thanks for having me, guys. Hey, good luck in that parenting thing. Woo, it's a clown car out there.